first time that Irina has seen this film, I think she's a, a little bit moved uh, by the experience, understandably. So uh, perhaps we might start uh, first uh, with you, Matt. Um, I first became interested uh, in Belarus in a serious way uh, back in 2009 uh, when I met uh, uh, Shasha Belarusi, uh, who was um, one of the presidential candidates. Uh, who had been in prison for about two years um, afterwards. After our meeting together in Oslo, uh, he uh, was imprisoned uh, in relation uh, to the events you saw um, in, this, in this film. Um, Matt, you worked uh, with one of Kelly um, in, in doing this film. And I remember um, when we had uh, a crew Menestar, who had disappeared. I don't know if Juan has told you this story, but we had, we had four people in Turkmenistan doing something uh, who all disappeared and were worried out of our brains. But at that same moment, um, Juan had a call, um, and you um, were having problems and about to be detained, and they wanted you to, to delete everything in your phone and, and so on. So can, can you speak a little bit about what the working conditions were like? Uh, in making this film, you are recover. Um, obviously, there's some freedom of movement, um, but also at the same time, some surveillance. So, can you speak about how how you manage uh, practically uh, to film undercover? When I, I I've been uh, two or three times, well, three times, and um, um, the second time I went, I had a cover story that I was a, a student trying to uh, I wanted to learn Russian. Um, and so I had to spend two days visiting various universities in, in the Russian department in, in Minsk. Um, and then I, I went on making the film, meeting various members of the opposition, going to where Lukashenko uh, came from. Um, which I have to say was actually quite easy. We, we stayed in the car, we never got out of the car. Um, we kept the cameras very well hidden. But when I arrived in Minsk for that second trip, I had hired a same people I always went to the flat from. And they were driving me from the airport to this farm. Um, and they stopped outside the KGB headquarters. Um, and my heart sank. And I thought they were playing some kind of practical joke, but they weren't. The flat I was staying in was next door to the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then on the way out, and Juan has told me that story when I was leaving. Um, they stopped me at the airport and, and took me into a, into, a, uh, into a room that I managed to text one and say, they're keeping me. <laughs> um, and yeah, they, they had, they, it was strange because they knew some of the places I'd been, they knew some of the people I'd met, but they didn't know everything. Um, and why they hadn't stopped me before, I don't know. Maybe because they wanted to, to get the material, I think they wanted my material. Uh, how do you think they knew some of the places you'd seen and some of the people you met? What, is, it, is this uh, human sources or is it uh, telephone interception? What is it? It, it could have been any of those. I mean, it could have been people telling them. It could have been they were following me, but not following me the whole of the time. Um, but I think they left it until the very end because they wanted to the uh, But luckily, I had uh, managed to get it out across the border to Poland, so I didn't have anything on me, although they didn't believe me, and I was, I was still so. How, how did you come to um, interact with the Belarusian community and, and want to make this film? I first went, I think it was like year 2009, I, I went there to make a documentary for the BBC on the Belarus Free Theatre. Um, and, and was just amazed at the work that they do and the people that I met, one of which was um, Irina's brother, Andre, and that I've interviewed him several times um, as a journalist. You had started making the film before he was in prison. Well, not this one. Not this one. We, we started making this film when I was with Arena on the night of the election that you saw in this film. We were screening um, my, the, the first documentary that we made on Belarus at, um, in central London, Index on Censorship, in solidarity with the opposition because it was the night of the election. And we were in a situation like this. We were receiving uh, emails, tweets uh, from Andre and other members of the opposition, and things seemed to be going really well. And then towards the end of the event, it emerged that actually that wasn't the case. Um, and so 
since that moment, I mean, it sounded very hard to get rid of me. What, Ambassador, what, what is the state of play right now? There's been this interesting action uh, with the European Union um, expelling uh, the Belarusian ambassadors from all, is it correct, all 27 uh, European Union states yesterday? Uh, no, the um, EU ambassador, Myron Moira, was um, expelled. It was made clear to her that gesture of solidarity. Um, as for my opinion on that, um, uh, perhaps I should stress that I am retired now. Um, my words should not be taken as those of the British government. Um, <laughs> it raises the question of whether we actually have a strategy, whether we, uh, the British government, the uh, EU, has a strategy towards Europe. And to be fair, it's very difficult to have a strategy. Uh, you know, the situation is fairly um, um, but I think um, this is an example. Withdrawing ambassadors is not a good idea. I lived there for four years, and uh, I think one can only truly understand what is happening in Belarus if one is there. Um, there's the body language, there's that sense of fear in the streets, um, uh, which you don't get when you're outside the country. Um, and the other the other side of the coin is that um, do we have an exit strategy for this policy of withdrawing ambassadors? Under yeah. what conditions would they go back? And under whatever conditions they go back, Lukashenko is going to say, there you are, I was right all along. And they've come back with their tails between their legs and uh, I'm going to carry on. Uh, and that is, of course, the fundamental problem. It's a black and white situation. It's absolutely hopeless and will remain hopeless until Lukashenko goes. So the strategy has to involve putting pressure on Lukashenko to get him out some way or another. What, what do you think, um, the, you know, the, you said, when we were speaking before, and you said, you thought one of the, the problems was that there wasn't a strategy, that Europe didn't have a strategy, Britain didn't have a strategy, um, that there is no strategy, and, and perhaps this move is just simply reactive. Lukashenko has made a move, uh, Europe has reacted, uh, and now there's a question about how, how the matter can be resolved. Um, should, should there be a, a strategy of, of removal or engagement or, or engagement and selective pressure? Um, I think there is no strategy. Uh, the EU's understandable approach, perhaps, is we've got to do something. And somehow it doesn't matter what it is that we do. We just have to do something. And that, that is wrong. Um, I don't think um, engagement is a good policy, uh, not because engagement doesn't work else, elsewhere in the world, but because there is no point in talking to Lukashenko. He will simply tell you what you want to hear, make promises that he will sort of keep to, but actually have no substance to them. So there is no point. Um, and my, uh, my, my line is that um, it's only by putting him under such stress that longer cope with the situation that um, things will change. And so the strategy is, has to be somehow to put the pressure on, uh, both through the economy and through political noise, political complaints, but um, and complaining about people being in prison uh, without um, trying to give him a reward for releasing them. That's, um, uh, that's not going to work. Um, if only because um, rewarding people like that to further people ending up in prison. Uh, Irina, why do you think not many people uh, care about Belarus or it's, it's, it's not part of the European calculus? Um, in all honesty, it's a real puzzle to me because Belarus is in the center of Europe. It's, it is a European country. Um, and I, I still don't understand why so much, if so little attention is given to Belarus. Uh, we know how much attention was getting in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Syria, Iran, and quite rightly so. But Belarus is not better at all, and it is in the center of Europe. So 
actually one of the uh, reasons we are all here today is spread the world uh, the world and raise the awareness and that's why I'm extremely grateful to Mark Charles and for, uh, for making this film because hopefully you know, more and more people will see what it's like uh, to live in Belarus first of all and secondly to have their loved ones in prison and as I said in the film uh, it's not just 17 people who are left in prison now are in prison. It's, it's 10 million people living in prison now. What's the current status with your brother Andre? Is, is there a, a change since uh, what we saw in the job? Um, yes, there is a little bit of a change, a little bit of an uh, improvement on one hand. You know, it's, it's horrible to say that uh, knowing that he is alive and knowing where he is, it's because you know, when the film was made, we didn't know where he was. Um, we now know which prison he is in, and we know he is alive, but that's about it. We absolutely know nothing. But what, are, what are the, the formal allegations against the uh, presidential candidates, the five that were put in, put in prison? Um, actually, they are different, believe it or not, even though they've all been on the square, but um, after a while, they change the allegations, uh, but for, to Stadkevich and Sannika who remain in prison, the allegations are uh, organizing uh, the ma mass disturbances, which you've seen people walking on the streets very peacefully, uh, in a long run from one square to another, not even one rubbish bin was ever overturned, so what sort of violence or disturbance they're talking about, it's absurd. I, I met you before with Hay, and I, I've seen this uh, transition that you've had in the film, which I think you may have documented quite well, where to begin with, you were just a sister, um, and now you're a campaigner, and, and you seem much stronger than you did in the beginning. Um, can, you, can you speak a bit about um, perhaps what this experience was like for you, but in a, in a practical sense, that you have now become, if you like, a proper activist? Um, and advice you might have for uh, other activists, uh, people fighting for the liberation of their loved ones, uh, or others in a, in a similar position. How did you uh, manage to negotiate that experience? Um, I'm glad you think I'm a proper activist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a sister and, and um, who fights for my family because it's obviously you've seen it's not only my brother who is in prison, it's my sister in law who lives under a horrendous condition under house arrest and the uh, police can budge in at any time of the day and she's just a single woman there with a small child. Um, but um, you know I'm, I'm I have a very strong sense of justice. So it probably helps me to keep going and um, keep fighting for all political, political prisoners. At the moment, I'm extremely concerned about Sergei Kovalenko, and I actually, once we finish talking, I would like us all to say Julien Belarus in support of him, because he is in prison only for raising the flag, uh, Belarusian flag, white, red, white flag, and he is on a hunger strike, and he is virtually dying in prison and it feels to me that the world doesn't care, the world doesn't value that single human life. Instead of shouting, screaming, protesting, you know, it, it goes unnoticed. And I think that sense of justice um, helps me to keep going and, and, and the understanding that I can't sit and do nothing. I can't sit and watch countries being, uh, you know, genocide happening in my country, um, the best people are being tortured, imprisoned, repressed, um, people are being let die in prison, I just can't watch it and do nothing, that's why I'm campaigning, and that's why we started this regular now campaign, and I would like uh, to ask you all to support us in whatever way you can, even if you just tell somebody about what you've seen today, what you've learned about Belarus, that will be fantastic. I will be very grateful. Alexander Balaski, um, Sasha, uh, before he was placed in prison, uh, told me that the big problem 
for him was, was not prison, it was that his family outside of prison, his daughters, were economically uh, marginalized. And that uh, they, they couldn't even marry because their husbands would be economically excluded from any, from any um, social, functional, social utility. Is there not just the, prison, the political prisons, but once they come out, um, people are the house arrest, people uh, economically marginalized. Is that true? It's, uh, yeah, it is absolutely true. Unfortunately, we were going to have a form of political prisoner here today. Unfortunately, um, there were some traveling pro problems and he couldn't come. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to tell you a first part about his experience. But I am in touch with all um, majority of ex-political prisoners, uh, which I, I hesitate even to call them ex because they are still under such a surveillance they're not allowed to, to work they are some of them are speaking to me um, on the Skype only and still fearful of being overheard, they still can't say what they want, their families in horrendous conditions some, uh, some send their families to live in the country, in the village just to protect them from repressions and it's just had, uh, unfortunately this plague is spreading uh, and more and more people are being repressed in Belarus and more and more people are either losing their jobs or uh, threatened or imprisoned for absolutely nothing. Uh, you can be just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and um, you will be accused of swearing on the streets and placed into prison. Uh, Irina, where, where do you think it's going the next, the next five years? The Tenko just had an election. Um, the Russian election uh, is uh, on March the, March the 4th, um, and Putin seems to be giving uh, out concessions at a tremendous rate in order to, to stay in power, uh, and will undoubtedly win uh, the March election. But uh, do, do you think that that tendency uh, for reform uh, in Russia might spill over into Belarus? Um. It, it is not an easy question because, as I keep stating, I'm not a politician. I can't really predict what's going to happen. Uh, I don't think politicians can. <laughs> um, what I would like to happen, of course, I would like uh, uh, for the EU and US uh, support Belarus in opposition. Not just the position, the democratic movement in Belarus, and help us to uh, change the regime and help us to, to become a democratic country. That's what I'm hoping for, that it will happen sooner rather than later. And uh, from my point of view, yes, of course I would like all prisoners to be released tomorrow and for it to be a condition of the ambassadors coming back. But in a way, to, to the, it, in this sense, Brian is right that it's again uh, using the political prisoners as a bargaining chip, which is absolutely wrong, because then we will be back to square one and nothing will change in the country. So we really need to have a support of EU uh, and pressure on Lukashenko to step down and uh, start changing country towards democracy. Uh, perhaps we can open up now uh, to, to the, the panel. Um, unfortunately, I have to go, is that right? I have to go. Um, <laughs> we have our own problems here as well. So, um, There's a question I, I would like to ask Brian. Thank <laughs> you.